All right. So hello to two of my favorite people in the environmental justice movement. Um, I'm Latricia Adams, I'm founder, CEO, and president of Black Millennials for Flint. And I'm super excited, one, because we are celebrating um, Children's Environmental Health Day. And while we are not anywhere close to what we need to be to make sure that this environment that we have borrowed from our babies um, is the way that it should be. But with these two dynamic ladies, it makes us feel hopeful um, that we will leave this earth a, a better place than, than how we received it. And so I am going to allow each of our special guests, and we can start with Andrea and follow up with Maria, and just give us a quick intro of who you are, and what you do. <laughs> My pleasure, Latricia. Uh, my name is Andrea Delgado. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, in my current capacity, I serve as Government Affairs Director for the United Farm Workers Foundation. So this is an organization that serves farm workers in the leading agricultural areas in the country. These are the hired laborers, so the people that are out there day in and day out performing backbreaking work in a range of extreme conditions to make it possible for all of us to eat and to have the bounty uh, that we are able to bring to our tables. And not only that we eat here in the United States, but to make enough that we can export. That is thanks to the backbreaking labor performed by farm workers. And I have the honor of serving as their advocate. Um, and who I am, besides the, the, the wonderful uh, privilege that I have to be able to advocate for the people that feed us, I am an immigrant. I am a Latina. I am an Afrodescendiente. I'm Ecuadorian, Colombian, and as of only a couple of years ago, I could finally call myself American as I became a naturalized citizen. So I am many things. I'm multicultural, I'm multilingual. Um, I am proud to be an, an immigrant and to be serving in this capacity since I feel like those lived experiences contribute so much to the passion that I bring to the work and the communities that I serve. So it's, it's an honor to be with you today. That was beautiful. And I learned so much, so many new things um, that makes me just adore you even more. So, so thank you for the introduction. Yes. All right. And Maria? A lot of pressure. No, um, I'm Maria Lopez Nunez. And thank you so much. Right. It's it, we're here because of you. Um, I work with the Ironbound Community Corporation here in Newark, New Jersey. We're the largest city in the state of New Jersey. But what's special about Newark or what's special about the Ironbound, my neighborhood, is we're a four square mile um, neighborhood that has two power plants, the state's largest garbage incinerator, the state's largest waste treatment plant. We're surrounded by the longest Superfund site in the country. Um, and so you kind of name it, we have it. We're right next to the second largest port in the country, right? So that means that 5,000 trucks barrel through our neighborhood every day. And that's why in Newark, we have one of the um, highest childhood asthma rates, right? One out of every four kids has asthma in our neighborhood. Um, and well, I wish you could hear it, but there's planes going over me right now because <laughs> we're also home to the Newark airport. So while people know New York City, they often forget about Newark and they forget about the sacrifice zone that's made of Newark so that you can keep a metropolis like New York City going. Because anywhere there's a Fifth Avenue, there's probably an ironbound um, really close by. Wow, and that is devastating um, about those child asthma rates. Um, you know, I, I came into the world um, essentially with, with asthma. And I think about where uh, my grandparents lived. And of course, you know, as a black woman, I was with my grandparents all the time, but it's literally um, smokestacks. You can see them from the expressway from miles back. And, you know, that's the cause where black and brown people, including children are right there in the middle of this toxicity. Um, so that, thank you for sharing that. And that's a really good segue. Um, I actually want to start with Andrea. So um, good data point that Maria mentioned. Also another key point that really, um, really hit me in the spirit as a, as a current educator. Um, so according to research published in the American Journal of Public Health, 
children of migrant farm workers experience a variety of health risks and conditions. Primary care practitioners have rated Mexican-American migrant children two to three times more likely to have poor or barely fair health as opposed to good or excellent health compared with non-migrant children. So what do you think are some of the environmental hazards that are the most dangerous to uh, farm workers, um, including those farm workers that are actually under the age of 18? And what could be done to better advocate uh, for these young people and children? Thank you so much for that question. And I, I'll give a little bit of context because I feel like it's also such an important question that's tied to the history of the United States and how we're failing farm workers. There's about 2.4 million farm workers across the country. And it's estimated that between 500,000 to 800,000 are minors in agriculture. So this is children that are either accompanying their parents to work trying to make a living to support the economic security of their families. And I'll just have us sit with that data point there and then just add that sadly, the history of agricultural work in the United States is a history of racism. And it began with the era of slavery and persists to this day. And I'll tell you why. The racism that pervaded the agricultural sector during the Jim Crow era remains enshrined in our labor laws. And this impacts the kind of working conditions and economic conditions that impact the households in which these children are living. So during the New Deal period in the 1930s, when there was massive labor reforms made and many workers in other industrial sectors were able to achieve gains on wages, on protections, on things like the right to overtime pay, President Roosevelt and his allies were able to obtain the support of Southern congressmen by explicitly excluding farm workers and domestic workers from key labor protections. Members of Congress at the time were explicit that they did not believe that people of color deserve the same protections as white people. That is just the reality. So that's what I mean when I say the enshrinement of racism and discrimination in our laws that persist today. Because to this day, farm workers are excluded from key protections. So this notion contributed to the exclusion of this workforce from these basic labor laws. And it was wrong then when most of the farm workers were black. And it's certainly wrong now when four out of five farm workers are Latinx or of indigenous ancestry. And many farm workers also experience serious harms because of our country's broken immigration laws. About one out of two are undocumented. So when you're talking about a workforce that um, does not have legal recourse, is afraid that they might be deported, is afraid to speak out in the workplace, either because they don't have the same economic mobility. If they're undocumented, they may not want to raise concerns about what's happening, what pesticides are being exposed to in the workplace, to your question about what kind of hazards are kids and their parents exposed to. If you're a farm worker, you're regularly exposed to a range of pesticides that go on our food. And even if you're not bringing your children to work, when you come home, the simple act of hugging them, of coming into contact from them, picking them up from school, while you're covered in harmful residues that could potentially threaten the development of their brain, like that is a toxic trespass. Like the kind of job that you do should not be undermining your health, nor the ability of your children to develop well and to have healthy brains. That's those are the kind of false choices that farm workers are being made, you know, unfortunately have to make. And if they're not being you know, trained about the kind of hazards they're exposed to, if they um, aren't trained about how to mitigate some of those exposures by removing their clothes, you know, washing them separately, leaving the shoes outside or separating um, the, the personal protective equipment or other material that may have come into contact with those toxic substances then their children and family members are coming in contact with it. So um, that's just one aspect of the environmental exposures. And another big one that's very visible, because sometimes pesticides can be hard to see unless you're being directly sprayed, extreme heat and climate change. If you're an outdoor worker, you're performing backbreaking, strenuous work under extreme temperatures. We just saw very recently how across the West and Pacific Northwest and of the United States, temperatures 
reach beyond 110 degrees. And farm workers, including miners, were out there trying to earn a living without access to basic things like water, shade, a paid rest period, you know, the ability to identify training on how to identify the signs of heat illness. So when we're thinking about you know, things that threaten and undermine the health and safety of farm workers and children in agriculture and also take home exposure, we're talking about this toxic exposure to a range of agricultural pesticides and also to extreme heat. Um, and children in particular, children are more vulnerable to extreme heat and heat stress than your average person. So these are just some of the things that are undermining the health and safety of this community, in addition to other social economic determinants of health, such as housing, the lack of access to health care, lack of proximity to medical, a medical facility that can help when they're sick. Um, and this is all a long way of saying that, sadly, what your parents do and the economic conditions and precarious conditions that they're in have um, an association with the kind of conditions that the children are going to be in and the, the choices that are going to be left to them. And that's something that, that we're fighting to overcome. To your question about what can we do to advocate for farm workers? Well, uh, a key thing that the United Farm Workers and the UFW Foundation do is make sure that key decision makers in the administration and Congress are hearing directly from farm workers themselves, hearing their stories not just from an academic standpoint, but that they're really internalizing that these data points have real human beings behind them, human beings that deserve to show up to work and not have to be exposed to a neurodevelopmental um, agricultural chemical. You know, human beings that, you know, had to serve the right to water and basic precautions so that extreme heat doesn't make them 30 times more likely to die uh, just because of the nature of the work that they do. And there's bills out there that we're advocating for. We're advocating for a ban on chloroperifos, which the EPA recently made a, a big announcement on. There's some accountability there to make sure that we're not allowing industry to get carve outs or exemptions for using this very, very harmful nerve agent on our food. And there's many more pesticides like it that our children are eating, real residues on fruits, on vegetables that we feed to nourish our children every day are residues of nerve agents, things that should simply should not be on our food because the threat they threaten our children's brain. So that's some of the things that we're fighting for, as well as protections from heat stress, which um, I also have the pleasure to be advocating for in the, in the White House Council that you and, and Maria and I um, are all able to serve on. While I am, you know, happy about our administration, I would just like to nominate you now for President of the United States of America. I mean, that was just an incredible narrative. And I just want to commend you for being able to take something that can be very technical, um, where things surrounding um, farming and the toxicity and environmental hazards in, in that realm is not necessary as my granny would say my ministry but I now feel empowered you know that I can also advocate a, a lot more in in that regard um just uh mind-blowing just what you shared um thank you for that and you know my heart always just uh turns into mush about our babies um, about all humanity, but especially uh, with our children. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, shifting gears just a little bit to um, my other favorite person, um, so with Maria. Um, so while New Jersey, as you mentioned, I mean, has uh, to say about with EJ issues is an understatement. Now, recently, somewhat recently, in 2020, the New Jersey governor signed S232, which is boasted as being one of the strongest and most progressive EJ justice bills in the country. Um, so knowing that and thinking about from a federal perspective um, about, being, about there being a big push for environmental justice, what do you think the current White House administration 
um, could learn from this uh, bill that is essentially monumental um, in New Jersey, especially as we think about the Build Back Better plan, um, as well as the Justice 40 initiative. What are some things that, you know, could connect? Mm, such an easy question, right? <laughs> Thank you for the softballs. No. So um, first, let me back up here with uh, what is S-232 or, you know, the strongest environmental justice bill in the country? And why is it the strongest? Um, so what the bill does, it defines an EJ community and we try to be as protective as possible. So that's one thing the administration needs to learn, right? Be as protective as possible. And our bill defines an EJ community of any community that is over 40% people of color or 40% linguistic isolation, because we know that the census does not do everybody right, especially not immigrants who are confused by our racial categories, right? They're different <laughs> in different countries. And so we have those two kind of safeguards, or if it's 35% of, um, a community uh, below the poverty line, right? So neighborhoods like ours in the Ironbound, we're 51%. So we clear that really easily, you know, where Newark as a whole is 92% people of color, you know, we're a majority black and brown city. So we define EJ communities, great. So if you're an EJ community, when there's an application for a facility coming to your neighborhood, it's gonna have to figure out um, if you're an EJ community, are you overburdened? And I always like to explain this as something a four-year-old can tell you because our, our little four-year-olds, right? That come to the garden every Saturday, they could stand on the corner and they're like, there's a smoke stack over there. There's a smoke stack over there. And there's a smoke stack over there. Like, should we add another smoke stack? The answer is obviously no. But that was something that before our law, the law could not see us, right? Like the law had to treat every facility as an individual, very American. Right. Everybody's an individual. And do you go up to your individualized limits of pollution, of arsenic, of lead, of mercury, of dioxin? Right. Like, are you hitting that limit or exceeding it? And it didn't matter that they put, you know, uh, we have 130 brownfield sites in our neighborhood. Right. Like all of that should not be con uh, concentrated. And then the way that the chemicals mingle with each other and the way that we breathe that in it has an impact. And so this law brings that impact to the surface. And if the answer is you're adding to that impact, then your facility shall be denied, right? It gives that denial priority. There is no more suggestions. And that's another thing I wanna see the administration do. Deny permits, deny pipelines. Don't just suggestively say or make environmental justice impact statements great, this law goes beyond the statement. It says what you have to do after you find that there's a harm to people is you have to protect people and you have to say no. So I would love to see the administration say no to false solutions and say no to things that harm human health and especially no to things that even a four-year-old can tell you are not good for human beings and are not good for our planet. You know, so I think those are the lessons that I, I, I feel like could be replicable. And it's not just about how you permit. We can't see facilities as individuals anymore. We need to think about them in community. And in community, facilities are bad actors and they're not being good neighbors. So if you're not being a good neighbor, we should kick them out of our community to protect those of us that are, you know, trying to protect and um, better our country, right? Our neighborhoods and all the territories for everybody else. I mean, you just hit all of that on the head. I mean, that is just, I think, in all aspects of policy, there has to be some consequences. Otherwise, it's performative. We can, we know what's right and we know what's wrong. And I, I love the fact that um, you said, like, industry is not, they're not being good actors in community and they need to put them out, period. It, it should not be any rebuttal. Uh, to that, it, it should be that cut and dry. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that narrative. And we got a whole lot of work to do. Um, but I know uh, with the three of us and some other like uh, dynamic leaders um, from across the country, we're going to keep fighting until somebody is held accountable um, for this both past, uh, present, and the future as well. So thank you for sharing that. And so we're going to transition, I know it's like super short, but to our last question. Um, so one of the things among many that I love so much about the Children's Environmental Health Network is one that they focus on kids. Um, a lot of times um, when we think about environment, we think about 
the very like tangible things that are happening to the environment, but not necessarily keeping humanity um, at the core. So when climate change happens, what is happen to, happening to human beings also being inclusive of children who depending on their age, they can't speak for themselves, right? And so when we think about that notion, about that concept, in your opinion, why do you think, and this is a, a beautiful kind of mantra of sorts that the Children's Environmental Health Network kind of uh, abides by, why do you think children should be at the center of our work? And either Andrea or Maria, either one of you can, can take it away. Sure. Well, there's multiple angles from which we can look at this, but I'll try to keep this quick. One, we have a moral imperative to protect children and their health. From a public health standpoint, they are a subpopulation that is more vulnerable to exposure to a range of toxic pollutants, chemicals, pesticides, you name it. So their bodies are at, are at crucial stages of development, and it's development that we cannot allow to be compromised by the environmental conditions in which they're living in. So we cannot allow children to be robbed of their intellectual potential because of what they're breathing or the toys that they're able to play with or because they live next to a super fun site. That's just some of the imperative there. And in, besides that, you know, putting them at the center of this also involves giving them ownership over these fights. I mean, they are, they are the owners of the future. And we want to make sure that we're getting them started early on this advocacy so that they're aware of what's happening so they can continue to carry on once it's time for us to be passing the baton. Yeah, um, I mean, for us, children are at the center in Ironbound, right? Because actually one thing about Ironbound, we started in the 60s because women needed um, access to child care. So we started with schooling, but then we realized like even if you give it all you have, into a kid's schooling, they're forever impacted by the environment, by the air that they breathe. So when I mentioned earlier, the 5,000 trucks that go through our neighborhood, the, the bottom, the back of that truck, the tailpipe is pushing out particulate matter 2.5. And it's a particulate matter that's so small, once you breathe it in, it never leaves your body. You know, it starts affecting your respiratory system, your nervous, nervous system, your brain. Um, Sorry. So that's something that for us is super important to think that even if we, if, you know, like the, this country likes to say, like, if you just work hard, you'll be fine, but that's not true. And that's definitely not true for black and brown kids, especially right. Who are disproportionately affected by pollution and the impact that that pollution has on their bodies from now until forever, you know? So even if they make it elsewhere in life, um, like I recently lost my best friend to a heart attack, you know, he was only 34. And it's because he grew up, right? Breathing this air, it's gonna have an impact. And so many of the folks who grow up in our neighborhoods might die early as a consequence. So that's why for me, it is keeping kids at the center and making sure that everybody gets a good chance at a long and healthy life, right? Um, and so to do that, we have to prioritize children in health and we need to think about their environment and the devastating impact that they could have or the good impact that that could have. But unfortunately in this country, it only happens if you're rich or you grew up in a suburb lined by trees, you know, it's like how much how much money your family makes and what, what is your race of you and your parents, that makes all the difference and that's not fair. You know, so we need to prioritize obviously children so that we are passing a legacy of justice onto them. Yes, a legacy of justice. Come through, Maria, for the close up and wrap up. Um, I thank you so much um, for this brief but powerful conversation. Um, I'm also super excited um, that as uh, WeJack members, and I'll be careful, we're not speaking on behalf of the WeJack. I'm going to follow the rules. Um, but if you have not had an opportunity to see some of the recommendations, I know we are very proud that there were specific recommendations that were made for children um, and also childbirthing people, because we have to think about children throughout the entire process of, of life and development. Um, so definitely optimistic um, about the, the future with pushing everyone from the federal level, state level, local level um, to really focus and keep children at the center. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you to the Children's Environmental Health Network and happy Children's Environmental Health Day. Yay.